Okay, you can do it. A little louder. Oh. Can you stop talking? You can talk afterwards. Uh, to get started, we have Mike Baylor today. From uh, well, he was a uh, grad student of Jim Stone, and he's going to talk about his thesis work on boundary layers uh, in fusion physics. Yeah. Uh, so it's actually also done with, with uh, Roma and Jim Stone. Um, and so <coughs> yeah, today I'm going to be talking about how uh, kind of boundary layers. Uh, might behave a little bit differently than uh, what people thought before. Uh, specifically how, because the flow is supersonic, how waves can be excited there and how these waves can uh, transport angular momentum. So waves rather than uh, turbulence would be the, the story. So, you know, what, what is a boundary layer? Uh, well, uh, if you have a binary uh, system, So if we have a, uh, a binary system where uh, essentially one of the objects has collapsed to a compact object, a neutron star, a white dwarf, and the other object has become a giant star, uh, the star starts to overflow its Roche lobe, uh, it generates a accretion disk around uh, the compact object, and uh, you know the material slowly spirals, losing angular momentum until it reaches the close to this object. And when it reaches close, uh, one of two things can happen. So if the magnetic field of this object is strong enough, uh, the disk will be disrupted and it will flow along the magnetic field lines. And so the criteria for this is essentially that the uh, magnetic pressure exceed the azimuthal ram pressure of the, ma of the material in the disk. So Essentially, your you know, B squared, whatever units you want to use, uh, your magnetic pressure is greater than um, the rho B phi squared. And it's actually a very similar argument to the, uh, well, it turns out the argument may be different, but the scaling is the same as the scaling for the uh, Bondi radius um, in just spherical accretion, but uh, now just replace the gas pressure in that argument with the magnetic pressure. But I'm actually going to be talking about the case not when it is disrupted, but when the magnetic field is too weak to disrupt it, so the disk can actually extend all the way to the surface of the uh, compact object in the midplane without uh, going up along the field lines. So, you know, kind of the uh, probably simplest uh, statement you can make about the boundary layer is actually for a uh, Keplerian rotation profile, um, you have to dissipate, you know, if, if your star is slowly rotating, you have to dissipate actually half of the accretion energy in the boundary layer. And that's just because uh, for the Keplerian profile, half of the energy is uh, essentially kinetic. So, uh, you know, kinetic energy is uh, minus half the gravitational energy. So, so you have to dissipate as much energy in the boundary layer as you do in the entire accretion. So energetically, it's actually an uh, important uh, component of the system. Um, <coughs> it can be less than that if the star is rotating, because you actually some of the energy is not dissipated, but actually goes towards spinning up the star. In the extreme case, if the star is rapidly rotating, you don't dissipate any energy. You can actually just torque the star, essentially. Um, so the kind of boundary layers I'm envisioning for this presentation are where the disk extends as a thin disk all the way to the surface of the star. So in this case, I've plotted um, a white dwarf, and so these white dwarfs can be in uh, these CV uh, cataclysmic variable systems where an instability in the disk can drastically change the mass accretion rate through the system, and the instability is far away, it has nothing to do with the boundary layer. But when the, the, the disk has two, two states, a high state and a low state, and so in the low state, it turns out the disk doesn't really reach the surface of the white dwarf as a thin disk, and the reason you know this is actually there's very high x-rays coming from the system, and so you know that this material has to be close to the burial temperature, and if it's close to the burial temperature, that means it's actually very tenuous and vertically extended, so it has a scale height, the disk would have a scale height of order of the uh, stellar radius, but what I'm actually envisioning is um, it, 
in, you know, in the high state of these systems, you actually don't see uh, the X-rays so much. You see uh, soft, uh, you know, soft UV emission, and so it's actually much cooler, much lower than the burial temperature. It actually remains as a thin disk uh, all the way to the surface of the star, assuming the magnetic field is weak enough. Uh, yeah, one important point I should actually make. So, kind of the condition. One of the um, things that happens when the disk is thin, uh, you automatically actually have a high Mach number for the disk. And so, by Mach number, what I'm going to define is uh, essentially the Keplerian rotation velocity divided by the sound speed. And so, uh, the disk. If the disk is uh, thin vertically, you actually automatically have a high Mach number because the disk scale height scales as a Mach number minus one, which is the Mach number, times the radius of the star. So for, for the white dwarf system I showed, a characteristic my Mach number might be 40. So the disk is 40 times thinner than the radius of the star at, at the surface of the star. Uh, and what are these equations? Well, this, so I'm going to show uh, more of a 3D case, but before people had a powerful computers, they could uh, do the 1D case. And by 1D, I mean similar to uh, kind of a Shakura, Sunyaya type accretion disk theory where your one dimension is the radial dimension. Now, of course, the problem is three dimensional, but <coughs> what you do is you average in the other two dimensions in the vertical and in the phi. And so you're really only left with uh, one free variable, the radial dir direction. And so you have uh, a lot of, um, you have several differential equations. So, um, you know, just like in uh, Shakura Sunyaya's theory, you can postulate a constant <coughs> mass accretion rate through both the disk and the boundary layer now. Uh, you can postulate a uh, constant uh, flow of angular momentum, constant angular momentum current. Um, and this is uh, the uh, equation of angular momentum transport. And uh, because actually the pressure in the boundary layer is going to, the radial pressure is now going to be substantial because you're no longer going to be supported entirely by the Keplerian rotation, uh, you're actually going to start being stratified. And so in a Keplerian disk, this equation wouldn't really be present. You would just have uh, omega equal omega k. But now you actually have to consider the radial stratification as well. And uh, you know, in a classical kind of this disk is disk picture, you have something called the alpha viscosity. And so the alpha viscosity, it, or the alpha parameter, is just a uh, parameter to parameterize the strength of the viscosity. So viscosity has units of a velocity times a length. And so the alpha is just a constant you know, of order unity, uh, often much less. But uh, what you do for, and this is in the angular momentum transport equation here. So what, what you would do is you would actually uh, you know, parameterize the viscosity in this manner, and assuming the viscosity is due to kind of turbulent eddies. But uh, if you notice, actually, the radial scale height in the boundary layer is now going to be much smaller than the vertical uh, scale height in the disk itself. And so the people doing these 1D models have to take this into account. And to get physically sensible results, they would have to, for instance, take the minimum of these two quantities, because otherwise they would have a very high viscosity, which would lead to unphysical results, like supersonic impulse and things. So um, an interesting question that, you know, out of, that comes out of all of this theory is, what, what happens to be the mechanism of angular momentum transport in the boundary layer? And so it's not going to be MRI turbulence, because actually the boundary layer the rotation profile is rising. So the star is more slowly spinning than the disk. And so actually, the rotation profile has a uh, positive derivative with the radius. So d omega dr is greater than 0. And for MRI, you need actually a falling uh, rotation. Uh, d omega dr has to be less than 0. And so you know, um, one issue that these, this picture of this one-dimensional boundary layer doesn't address is what is actually the source of the turbulence boundary layer. And so I'm actually going to argue in this presentation that uh, the angular momentum transport doesn't happen by turbulence but by waves. So it's, a very, it's actually going to be very different from this 1D uh, picture. So this is from a simulation I'm going to run, but just to explain some of these, uh, uh, what the plot is showing. Uh, here I have a wedge in a cylindrical simulation. And so uh, I've, I've compressed it to a rectangle because most of the action is going to be happening here. So just to amplify <coughs> this region. And this is 
uh, about, I think, like two pi over seven um, would be the extent of this. So it's not a full, this particular simulation is not full two pi, but we have MRI in the disk. Uh, and this, this is showing the magnetic field magnitude, and this is the uh, essentially the radial velocity times the square root of the density, and this, this r doesn't really make much of a difference. But the reason I plot it like this is because actually waves, as they propagate to more dense environments, they conserve, they conserve their, um, their energy. And so the energy would be uh, rho vr squared, for instance, or rho, rho delta v squared. So, you know, in equilibrium, this would be zero, but because there's waves, a radial perturbation is excited. And uh, so just to mention here, uh, this is the disk now. And so the star is actually this region just inside of one. So it looks like it's very close actually to the domain boundary, but there's actually 4,096 cells across this radial direction. And so there's actually uh, you know, quite a number of cells in this region. And the density is actually rising very rapidly here. So it goes from a density of one here to a density of uh, several million at the inner boundary. So actually, if you were to dump all of the angular momentum in the disk into this small region here, you would not actually spin it out very much. Um, so, okay, so I'll uh, play the simulation. Oops. So you can see it much better in the uh, radial velocity than you can in the magnetic field. Uh, do, you, do you have your presentation on the memory stick, or do you put it on another computer? Yeah, um, yeah, I have my movies are nice. Yeah, I have my computer here, so I don't know if you guys don't mind. I'll probably take. A yeah, let's take a five minute uh, okay. pause and, and get it set up. Okay, let's let's do that. This is the, the, the I'll best, go a little bit. I'll go a little bit faster for the rest of the presentation. Okay.
rotate it so it's a fixed pattern speed. And so, you know, even though this disk is actually differentially rotating, this is a well-defined wave. No, no, so this isn't using Fargo or anything. Um, yeah, one of the reasons I didn't use Fargo for this is actually the, uh, the rotation profile is varying over time. So now that we've actually done it, now you can probably use Fargo, but uh, it's probably safer just to use the, like, Fargo assumes there's a Keplerian background profile, right? Right, so but it's not capture the non-Keplerian. It's not, this is not, yeah, I mean, this is not Keplerian. So oh, I mean, you could probably use some generalization of Fargo, but uh, yeah, that's we didn't do that. Uh, although you know it would probably speed it up by a factor of ten if you did that. But again, then you'd be like unsure if you're numeric, et cetera, et cetera. So, so yeah, I mean now that you kind of know what happens, it, you can check it now by using Cantor algorithms. Um, so to kind of explain what's going on here, I'm just going to show the most simple uh, profile that you can uh, use to generate this kind of physics. And the most simple profile is actually just a shear layer and um, with, I'm gonna use a linear profile across the shear layer. So you can imagine this being like the radial direction and this like the uh, phi direction. Uh, and so in the star, let's say you have zero uh, rotational velocity and your rotational velocity rises linearly to the uh, Keplerian this doesn't have to be zero, it can be anything. Uh, but what matters is actually the change in velocity across the shear layer. And actually, in dimensionless units, the quantity that matters is the Mach number. So the change in velocity across the shear layer divided by the sound speed in this region. So um, just with this very simple setup, uh, what do you find? Well, when the Mach number is low, you're in the incompressible case. So you would be in the classical just Kelvin-Helmholtz regime. And the classical Kelvin-Helmholtz regime, you just have two modes, one uh, growing and one damping mode. But uh, actually, as the Mach number exceeds one, so you drop in your shear layer is greater than sound speed, the, phys the physics changes. Uh, you go to this kind of like critical point looking thing. And uh, you know, rather than these uh, classical Cayetian stability, you get a shear acoustic instability. And the shear acoustic instability, you know, just very simply to show that it's different physics, you now actually have three modes rather than two modes. So you actually now have different, even different number of modes in the KH. And uh, whereas the KH is purely imaginary, actually this is predominantly real. Uh, they're predominantly acoustic waves, but there's actually a small imaginary component to them. So it's kind of an older stability. Uh, and the physics is um, is different from pure uh, KH. So this is this would be an eigenfunction now of the KH instability and of uh, the shear acoustic instability. Um, and so <coughs> the dashed line shows where the uh, flow has the same velocity as the phase velocity of the wave. So for this shear acoustic instability, actually the mechanism to make it unstable is a uh, resonant interaction right at this layer. And you can see the eigenfunction does something strange here. It looks like it undergoes a 180 degree phase shift. And also the amplitude changes drastically. So, so there's actually stuff over here, but you can't see it on this scale. And so this resonant instability is a uh, like a transfer of energy from between the wave and the fluid. And so it's similar to uh, like Landau damping in uh, plasma physics or uh, in fluid dynamics, uh, it's similar to, actually it's, very, it's similar to surfing for instance. So in surfing, you need to be going almost with the same speed as the wave to be accelerated by the wave. Otherwise you just go in a like little epicycle where the wave crashes over you and you tumble. So uh, when you're going very close to the speed of the wave, you can transfer energy and angular momentum. Uh, and this creates actually an instability. And you can't have it in the incompressible case because you don't have, um, you don't have anywhere in the flow that you 
actually going as fast as a sound wave. So you need to be having a flow that globally can go faster than a sound wave. It has to be globally supersonic. So this drop has to be greater than the sound velocity. So, so can I think of this as mode conversion into critical surface? Yeah, it's a critical layer. It's a co-rotation resonance. Well, but wait, in, in a stratified atmosphere with a mm -hmm. horizontal vertically shear flow, I have resonant interaction, say, gravity waves with uh, right. critical layers, right? right? And that's subsonic. That is subsonic, yes. And so, uh, indeed, um, if you were, so this is, yeah, so for the stuff I'm gonna show, uh, I actually have a, an isothermal equation state. And this, is, like, this simulation is not even stratified, this is just a simple shear layer. But even stratified with an isothermal equation state, you don't have any gravity waves, because for isothermal equation state, actually the uh, burn bias coefficient so actually, I don't have, uh, so what I'm going to be talking about is acoustic modes are generated, but actually you could also have uh, gravity modes. And so you'd actually have more than these three modes, you'd probably have like five modes, you know, at least. You'd have gravity modes that go in either direction, uh, against or with the flow. Um, but the reason I'm not going to be talking about that is actually then you would now have to start treating the cooling correctly, because you're going to get a lot of heating into shear layer. And isothermal, you don't have to worry about the so um, gravity waves could potentially be important, and they, I mean, they could be more important than uh, the sound waves, but um, indeed, there, there could be also these critical resonances with gravity waves <coughs> as well. I think the other question is that in the case where you're subsonic, you have a symmetry between top and bottom. Yeah. And that disappears. So what's what the dotted line again? That's the so the dotted line is, um, place where the uh, phase speed equals the flow speed. So essentially the flow is going with the same speed as the wave. And the reason the symmetry disappears is actually there's there's a exactly symmetric mode, but because I'm starting with random perturbations, you can develop either one. So there's actually the exactly symmetric mode for this one. Uh -huh. So um, in fact, in the right you're showing two modes, and in the left you're showing one? No, no, this is, one, this, is, uh, this is KH instability. So, so the KH instability, there are two modes, but one is drawing and one is damping. Okay. So the damping one just damps. Here, there are actually two modes with the same growth rate, but uh, going in opposite directions. But actually, uh, that symmetry is broken once you go to a rotating system, it turns out. Um, and just a growth rate estimate, um, the growth rate of this instability is roughly the sound crossing time divided by the width of the shear layer times some factor of epsilon. So it's similar to if you had like a laser in a gain medium and each time the laser goes back and forth, it gets a certain gain and so the gain factor here would be, uh, well, one plus epsilon I guess would be the gain factor. And so each time it crosses it, it amplifies. Um, it's, yeah, so, and with that kind of simple analogy uh, that uh, the uh, growth rate is the order of the sound crossing time plus the shear layer times some factor less than one, you get for an astrophysical system using numbers just from the simulations that it, the growth rate would actually be close to the orbital frequency. Uh, no, it's not like swing amplification. Because it's opposite from the gravity wave case where wave energy is both at the critical layer and it's at the subtle. Right. So it's an interesting. So it's an interesting point. Uh, so indeed, um, the absorption or uh, you know, excite, uh, uh, either the damping or the excitation of waves actually depends on something, and uh, that something is actually not uh, entirely clear. Um, so there has to be some criterion actually for damping or exciting. But actually, uh, you know, you can solve that it actually, like we solved the uh, dispersion relation for this linear shear layer, so it is indeed excited. And in the simulations, even when the shear layer goes away and it goes to a smoother profile, the wave continues to be excited. So there is indeed, has to, there does indeed have to be something to, there, there is indeed a physical criterion, uh, but I, I think that Criterion is actually not known. Is it like in Lando damping where it's critical to integrate yeah. below the pole in order to get the. Yeah, if, I had to, if I had to guess 
what, like, if I had to guess for a criterion, yeah, it would probably be something like the second derivative of the velocity in the rate over x. Because I don't understand what the top They both propagate away from this uh, place where they're excited. They both propagate. They both, both propagate sides. away. Okay. Yeah. It, there's no. Uh, they don't need to reflect off of anything. They just propagate away in confusion. So there's no reflection involved really, at all. Yeah. It's not really like a swing amplification though, because it's uh, it's not like shearing sheet or anything. This is. Uh, you know, I'm not considering shear waves. So, um, okay, so now to go to a more realistic model, you have a, uh, now you have stratification here with a star, and so the density rises very rapidly. And here you have a constant density in the disk. Uh, initially, the, these two are connected uh, with, the, with a linear profile, but over the course of simulation, the profile will actually adapt and widen. So initially, this is very thin, but it'll kind of self-adjust. And um, this interface is initially resolved with about 10 cells, but it'll be better resolved as the simulation goes along. Um, so, you know, there's no self-gravity, it's a fixed potential, and the Mach numbers we're considering are around 10. And uh, yes, yeah, so for simplicity, we're just gonna use an isothermal equation of state uh, to simplify things. Um, so indeed, you recover the same three waves that you get in the uh, in the unstratified case, and now we're actually in cylindrical coordinates and stratified, so that's good. And now, however, uh, there's new some new physics emerging here. So the wave still continues to be excited here. At, this is the uh, uh, co-rotation resonance now, which is in the boundary layer. But because the profile rises and then falls, there's actually a second co-rotation resonance in the disk itself. So there's two places now in the flow where the speed of the wave equals the uh, speed of the fluid. And so, although the wave is excited in this region, what can happen uh, if the two regions are separated, you can actually get reflection here off of the second co-rotation resonance. So the wave is sourced here, propagates out, and reflects back and forms kind of a standing wave pattern. Uh, and this region is evanescent uh, because actually, due to the epicyclic frequency uh, in, the, in the disk. Um, and here, actually, the two rotation resonances are so close together that you never actually reach this like WKB approximation where you have this nice wrapping and reflection. You actually just go straight through this you know, region that you would consider evanescent in the Keplerian disk, and you just uh, radiate angular momentum outwards. And so in this case, the angular momentum is kind of trapped in this region, although some of it can potentially go into the star. But actually here, there's a, it's a true radiation. Uh, and so rather than turbulence, these waves are actually uh, transporting the angular momentum. I was just asked about the southern one. This is like an entropy noise. That's in this middle one? Yeah, it's, uh, it's weird. There are it, frequencies. It, it is. Actually, the frequency is, for this one is always uh, 1 half. So if the omega is 1, the star is zero, it's always like one, very close to one half. But this one actually happens very rarely, and usually it's these two. And so I'll show a movie. Um, and so this is just from random perturbation. Now, this isn't 2D hydro, but it's uh, very similar. Very similar in 3D. Um, just, you know, this is a, uh, will be a good demonstration. Um, have just one resonance surface. Yeah. Uh, how does it know it's supersonic? That's a good question. Um, I mean, you claim that boundaries are important. Right. Um, so, I mean, there has to be, well, the reason it kind of knows it's supersonic is that there's a wave that's set up that has a uh, phase speed that has uh, place in the flow that has the same, there's this place in the flow where the phase speed of the waves equals the flow speed. So then the question is how do you actually set up such a global wave um, that has this property? So, so the point
point is that not only is the strength of the shear that matters as well, I guess. Um, no, no, the strength of the shear doesn't matter. Well, okay, for Keplerian, uh, for Keplerian, for actually a rotating disk, it matters, yeah. Because then, uh, if you're thin, then the epicyclic frequency doesn't matter too much. Well, but I can imagine a supersonic flow, right? But with very weak velocity shear, then how does it know it's supersonic? Because you have to go back to the Sandra Kelvin Hamilton school, I would think. No, no. So, I mean, it's like, it does the scale, the absolute scale doesn't matter. I mean, if you just have a shear layer, just forget about rotation or anything. Yeah. The only thing that sets the scale of the instability, you can express everything in dimensionless numbers. So it doesn't matter how thin or thick the. Once you add stratification, that adds like new length scales. And so then, yes, the shear would start to matter. This is the movie. Uh, and now I'm just plotting dr. I'm not multiplying by square root rho. Um, so actually, here you see this first wave that was in the upper left-hand corner previously, and it's radiating angular momentum outwards. Actually, some angular momentum also is going inwards. And actually, as it radiates angular momentum, there is accretion that happens in this region, and uh, the material falls onto the star. And so it's actually accreted from the disk onto the star. <coughs> due to the waves. Um, however, as the material continues to be accreted, you kind of deplete the center region, you don't have any more angle of momentum left there to radiate, and you end up forming like this trapped mode, uh, which no longer causes the density gap to increase. So that's kind of the sort of, you know, one of the reasons why the physics changes is because once you deplete this region, you can no longer radiate angle of momentum anymore to cause the accretion to happen. And so now you see kind of the structure is changing um, and you're setting up more of a, uh, and you can see there, there is some turbulence here perhaps in this region. So there could be like KH on the smaller scales. Um, but uh, overall you set up this global standing pattern. And this is all sound waves and the, the sound waves are shocking. So this is just comparison of uh, theory to simulations now. So one of the reasons we chose this isothermal equation state is just to make sure we understand what's going on. And actually, the uh, the solid and dashed curves are here the theoretical dispersion relations we come up with, and these dots and uh, squares are different types of simulations, like with without magnetic field. Um, uh, and so. Here I don't actually plot a, uh, a graph because actually this pattern speed, so the speed at which it, the pattern rotates is very close to, there's not much variation here. But uh, you, know, it, you can see that actually you can confirm that you, know, you understand what's going on here because uh, you, know, you get like 5% uh, accuracy for the phase speed for what you expect from theory. Uh, Well, you, you don't really, I mean, you would suspect the one with the faster growth rate to become dominant. But actually the growth rate is a kind of almost like a second, like a lower, it's a weaker quantity than the phase speed because the, the growth rate is actually only a fraction of the phase speed. It's actually harder to determine the growth rate than it is the phase speed. Um, but um, you can just make simple arguments that so in the beginning, you saw that the radiating mode was present, but eventually you just run out of angle momentum to radiate because I don't have anything like any MRI or anything to replenish the inner disk. And so then you can no longer radiate any more angle momentum. So you can only have this trapped mode. Well, is, is there a rough equality between the azimuthal wavelength and the primal gradient scale for the for V5 and the radial gradient scale? It's, uh, yeah, it's an interesting question. So. Um, I, yeah, it's uh, it's hard. It was.
was hard for us to really test a large range of Mach numbers, mm -hmm. but uh, indeed, um, yeah, I mean, it, it should scale that way. Yeah, but it's, yeah, I would say it should scale that way, but, um, yeah. So, okay, this is just to show the density gap here being opened up. And this is the density, the surface density of the disk. So this is from a 3D simulation now, but it's still purely hydro. And uh, you see, once the instability is excited, it uh, evacuates this inner disk of material. So the density goes from 1 to 0.5 or so, or 0.6. And then it kind of just forms this trapped mode, and no more uh, accretion happens. And a good way to understand the angle, angular momentum transport in the system is to look at the stress angular momentum current. And so this is the, uh, the Reynolds stress here, sigma uh, delta D phi dr, times r, so it's the angular momentum, times 2 pi r, because we're integrating it over a, uh, a ring. And if this is constant, uh, you have no mass accretion happening. And this is the specific angular momentum of the fluid. So it actually ends up being a very nice, simple formula here. Uh, so the mass accretion rate is, is, is related to how much angular momentum you're depositing in a uh, annulus. And so if there's much, if the stress angular momentum current is constant, you have as much angular momentum entering the annulus as you have leaving, so there's no accretion. So this actually has to vary for there to be accretion. And so you can see here, this is during the time when this radiating mode happens. You have uh, this del C S del R term is positive, so it goes from a negative value to a positive value, and so you see that due to these resonant interactions in the boundary layer, uh, you're actually giving the angular momentum to the wave and taking the angular momentum away from the fluid. And actually over here, what's happening is actually your CS is going down, the stress angular momentum current, because you actually have shocks. And so you're giving the angular momentum back from the wave to the fluid uh, due to these shocks. So you stop the well, it's actually anti, it would be anti-accretion. You're actually giving more angular momentum than, <coughs> the wave at this point has more angular momentum than the fluid. And so by dissipating the wave, you're actually, uh, you know. You're but, but then how can this describe some sort of long-term behavior for the boundary layer, because matter has to accrete? Uh, well, I mean, you have uh, MRI going to the disk, so you need to replenish that. This region is evacuated. You need to replenish it with stuff coming in from outside. But you already have a viscosity in the simulation, don't you? The no, 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 no. So this is just hydro. So there's so where's no your, how does your wave dissipate? I see. Through shocks. Just through shocks. Yeah. I see. So there is no accretion in the background. Yes. In this particular simulation, there's no accretion. But in the MRI simulation, uh, there will be accretion. So. Um, you know, we can compare wave versus this anomalous turbulent viscosity uh, to see what the differences are. And, uh, you know, so waves can travel, waves are non-local essentially. They can travel long distances before dissipating or transferring their angular momentum. Uh, whereas for turbulent viscosity, it's a local dissipation. So that's one difference, the locality. Um, for waves, the stress angular momentum current changes sign as rotation radius of the wave. But here, uh, for this turbulent viscosity, <coughs> actually, you change sign where there's no shear, or where the shear vanishes. There's no stress. So the Reynolds stress vanishes when there's no shear. So this is different, because this does the, the square d omega dr equals 0, and there's no shear. It doesn't have to be at the same place as where the rotation radius is loaded. And the, you know, the waves is generally a more complicated picture, because you have waves and different wave branches, whereas the turbulence, you hope that you can describe it using some quasi-steady state for the turbulence. So if you have suitably high knowledge, uh, you can get a constant alpha function. And so the conclusion is that it's really not correct to describe uh, processes involved in generation of waves with an alpha viscosity. And so this is the, you don't, like this equation doesn't matter so much the details, but this is just to show that this is what the mass accretion rate due to, for instance, a uh, alpha viscosity would be. And here we have due to uh, 
shock dissipation. And there's actually even a third term here, co-rotation, which is actually very important due to the transfer of the angular momentum from the fluid to the wave. And so you can see, you, you can, uh, you know, if you want, you can contrive to put, this is like delta sigma over sigma, the jump in density across the shock. So you can contrive to put this, for instance, shock dissipation result in terms of alpha, but it would be very artificial. And you would lose your hope of having alpha be a constant. So alpha is this uh, equilibrium that I had alpha. Okay, so finally we go to MHD simulations. And just to remind, again, the, the boundary layer is MRI stable, the disk is MRI unstable due to the slow of the rotation profile. And we have three different types of uh, magnetic field geometries. We have net vertical flux, so uh, just all in the vertical field of a, the same uh, sign through the disk. Then we have a net azimuthal flux, so just the toroidal field. And then we have zero net flux, so the magnetic field varies just sinusoidally with radius. And this is just showing um, now there's this condition for uh, the, MRI, the MRI specialists will know about. And this condition just shows that uh, when your angle of your uh, you know, when the, essentially the tangent of the angle between the radial and azimuthal field is around uh, 13 degrees, or actually when this angle is around 13 degrees, but the tangent will be similar because it's a small angle. So you actually, it's, there's a consensus in the literature that you've you know, done a good job resolving your MRI presence. So it's just to show that you know, we've done a good job over here once the MRI actually becomes active at later times, you know, this, this angle between the radial and azimuthal field is close to 13 degrees. So this is just to show that we have convergence of the MRI in our simulation. And uh, so you can ask, now that we have MRI, uh, well, you know, an interesting question to ask is now that we have MRI and we have this field advected now into this boundary layer which has a very strong shear, can you amplify the magnetic field to a very strong value just due to the fact that have a lot of shear, and so it's going to be, uh, you know, the, the field loops that are advected will be, uh, the magnetic field will be stretched. Um, it turns out that for the simulations we're running, you don't actually amplify the field very much. And so uh, I can discuss perhaps how you can change that picture as well. But for what we have, the field, uh, a, good, a good measure for the field amplification is this beta parameter ratio of the uh, gas pressure, which because we have uh, isothermal equation state, which is rho s squared, as this uh, sounds to you, and divided by the magnetic pressure. And so if beta inverse is small, so, so flip this around, if beta inverse is small, the magnetic pressure is very weak compared to the gas pressure. And in particular, these waves that we've described are acoustic <coughs> waves, and acoustic waves uh, start to be modified significantly when the when beta is beta inverse gets up to one. But if the magnetic field is small, the magnetosonic speed is close to the acoustic speed. So really you just have waves that are modified slightly. It's not a fundamentally different uh, phenomenon. So because we don't have significant field amplification, actually the picture doesn't change much for the waves once we add um, uh, MRI to simulations. And this is showing this beta you can see there can be some action here in the boundary layer in some of the simulations, but it still is much less than one. In the top case, what's the imposed beta, the beta of the vertical field? The initial imposed beta? Mm -hmm. Oh, I don't remember, but it's very... Uh, very low. Uh, it would be very large, the beta. So beta inverse would be yeah, very yeah, small. Yeah, I always, yeah, I, I can never remember which one those. So, I don't know, it's over, it's over a thousand. When I did this, I did check against the literature that it, it does also matter sometimes what initial beta you start with. So it was an okay, it was a good value of the initial beta to start with. Um, so the conclusion is just by advecting MRI field and shearing it, you can get some amplification in the boundary layer, but not to the point where the field is amplified to thermal. And this amplification, uh, one mechanism for it is due shear, uh, swing amplification of shear waves, um, and this is actually a work that was done by uh, Prof. 
Bob and Chan, who showed that you can amplify shear waves by a factor of uh, the magnetic uh, pressure by a factor of roughly 10 by the swing amplification mechanism. And we have maybe a factor of five in our simulation, so it's roughly completely. Uh, okay, so this is just showing again very, this is the same kind of plus. So this is the uh, radial velocity vertically averaged and it's sliced through the simulation. And so you can see that although there's now turbulence in the disk, this wave pattern still exists in the boundary layer. And the, you can't really see the wave at all in the magnetic field. So the magnetic field just looks like turbulence. Uh, and again, the explanation for why there's not much modification is because you don't have much field amplification, so the data inputs always stay small. Acoustic waves become just magnetosonic waves. and um, so it's not, the picture is not much different. So this is now a plot of, again, the uh, variation of the uh, density over time. Um, so you see, again, this vacuum gap is evacuated. But something interesting can also happen. Uh, perhaps as the gap is filled in, you can actually re-excite this radiating mode again. And so perhaps you can get some kind of stochastic behavior with filling in the gap, evacuating, and filling in the gap, evacuating, like this. Um, so this is now actually the, uh, now this is the stress angular momentum current I was showing before. And you can see now, whereas this region was mostly white in the Heider case, this, there's actually a lot of stress angular momentum current due to the MRI. But in the boundary layer, you have these waves now. And the waves, when this radiating mode is excited, you have these large like black spots here that correspond to these sudden dips in the density. So it's a very quick evacuation process. And, uh, just you know, another thing to show is that indeed the stress angle momentum current doesn't vanish for g omega dr equals zero as you would expect for a anomalous turbulent viscosity. Um, so indeed, waves are transporting angular momentum. Okay, so astrophysical implications. Um, so you know, because we have pretty simplified simulations, I don't want to make too many claims. Uh, but an interesting direction is because these <coughs> waves are now carrying a lot of energy, so like the boundary layer, even though it should be so luminous, radiating half the energy, it sometimes appears missing in the observations. And so perhaps you can explain this missing boundary layer by the fact that waves are transporting a significant amount of energy throughout the system. So if waves can transport energy and you know, dissipate it at a non-locally, then uh, perhaps you can get a different temperature. Um, the way basically, the photons can be emitted at a different temperature than you would just by the viscous dissipation. Did you say the waves dissipate by shock? Well, so I have, remember I have isothermal simulations. So if you have a more difficult structure of the, of the disk, then the wave can maybe be refracted up to the atmosphere. Then it wouldn't be able to carry any momentum. <coughs> uh, no, it's still carrying momentum. Not as far. I mean, the, the angular momentum is carried from the place where it's excited. Mm -hmm. And I mean, the place where it's excited, uh, the stratification is predominantly radial. But unless you dissipate energy locally, you're not taking any momentum away. Right, right. But the, there's two mechanisms for the angular momentum transport. There's dissipation due to shocks, and there's actually excitation of the wave due to the but the, it, you can actually, it does require dissipation, but it actually all works in like a classical setting. So even if you just use Euler equation with no viscosity, you still get the sensibility. Yeah, it's just, this layer is very thin. So you need a way to travel a very long time without dissipating to avoid this problem of gaining the boundary of the star. I mean, perhaps not, because remember the wave is also traveling into the stars. So there's wave going into the disk and into the star. But I agree, uh, to make any, any good claim, you should, you should do significantly more work so another interesting application is to periodic behavior in systems. So, you know, it's this very simplified model, but you get periodicity. Uh, so the acoustic waves have two paths of periodicity, really, to explain these. But uh, possibly if you include gravity waves, they would have a slower angular phase speed. So that would be more uh, a, a better option for explaining Um, so, just uh, you know, examples of how this this can actually apply to uh, astrophysical observations. And so, a few 
future prospects for this um, is you can uh, look at more realistic equations of space with cooling and radiative transfer. So you could study the gravity modes that are excited, and not just the acoustic modes, and perhaps you can see if you can find some connection between the oscillatory behavior in the astrophysical system. The field amplification is interesting um, because we only have a local MRI field, but if you have a global field, perhaps you can amplify it more because it's, uh, you have actually the field throughout the simulation domain that you can actually wind up. There's no real winding up of fields, it's just sh uh, shear of loops that are attracted to the MRI. And maybe there's some global dynamo process, you know, so that can be very complicated. And, uh, you know, this is actually probably the hardest of the three, but you can try to study the spreading in the meridional direction. Which no one has really done, I guess. But Sorry? No one has really done that yet. No, but it's actually very uh, tricky because uh, if you're, for instance, looking at a neutron star system, if you look at, like, the work of uh, Sunyaya, who's the first one to do this, he has this, like, levitating layer. And so... Well, the centrifugal force is, is playing a It's slope. actually radiation pressure. It's so it's, uh, it's like this, uh, it's like a radiation-dominated star or something. It's, like, unstable to blowing up. So if you have your simulation is just slightly some small change in the energy or something, your layer might just fly away. So it'd be very hard. It's like simulating a star that's radiation pressure dominant. It's a very finicky, unstable system, perhaps. I thought Eva Gamma did some numerical simulations. No? No. I mean, they're uh, semi-analytic. They're semi-analytic. <coughs> yeah. He's just solving, essentially, like elliptic type equations. Well, one interesting aspect of this is I mean, you're, you're imposing a star mm -hmm. with a much slower rotation than this. <coughs> but under what circumstances can one get a super rotating but hydrostatic mm. shell, you know, that's where, where the central force is quite s <coughs> significant in right. its structure, but still it's sub Keplerian at the surface of the star? Well, I mean, the boundary you, layer is, has a, has a, I mean, the boundary layer has a fast rotation. Well, like in the neutron star case, right, though, the stuff is burning when it hits the surface, right? So once yeah. it burns, it changes its mean molecular weight, and then, you know, there's a strong stabilization to the vertical mixing from that. Yes. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it would be, uh, uh, I mean, yeah, if you had, like, stratified layers with different molecular weights, yeah. Uh, you know, that's much more well, no, I mean, it just, you know, they're, they're I mean, you've yeah. done a beautiful job of this. So. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting with these acoustic instabilities, though. Um, they operate without really turning the fluid over so yeah. much, you know, it's wave, right? They yeah. don't, it's not like KH where you get these rolls up and yeah. everything, so. But, uh, you know, it's. Uh, but, but you're in the supersonic case, right? So. It is, but when you have these yeah. sharp jumps, mm -hmm. I don't really know what would, uh, what would happen there. I mean, the waves would partially reflect off of them. Um, but perhaps you can have also KH there. But again, it depends on all sorts of stuff, like is it stable, is it stratified, or, you know, it's very hard actually, without setting up the problem to make an answer. Yes? So in CD, there's this peculiar observation that even though it's hitting mass, you don't think it's too much. Is that spinning, I heard this for a long time ago, is it well, still spinning neutral, or? Uh, not spinning up in what, in what sense? In the sense that if you look at high growth in the center of the CD photon, they only have a spin rate like that. So when you look at oh, I see. It's much slower when you look at Um, You know, that's true. I think some white dwarfs are actually spinning fairly rapidly and others are not. So uh, I'm, I'm going to get the names confused, but there's like three. There's, th there's three that are nearby, and then one of them is actually spinning fairly rapidly, and the other two are, are not. <coughs> So my question was that uh, in your wave picture, could you imagine a star doesn't get any mass momentum, even though it's exceeding mass? Um, I mean, you know, it's very complicated. Like, you could also, you I mean, you'd have to do. I would say to really answer that very well, you have to do global simulations because you could also lose angular momentum for wind, right? So, but you can only really study that problem. With like, so here's an example, like you have your global field ejected into the boundary layer, 
and you create a little pinch zone there. And so maybe this pinch zone can create like some wind eruptions or something. And so maybe you can lose some angle in that gravity. So it's very, uh, it's a very complicated system overall. It's, it's possible that they have small magnetic structures for so because you could also put it on their speed. And if there's sufficient alignment. We're actually discussing this here at lunch because if you form a magnetic field, right, then all this energy that's in the sphere <coughs> when the pre material meets the surface of the star goes away, and now you have your dissipation basically at the boundary of the magnetic field. And so you greatly reduce the energy that's available for amplifying the magnetic field. And in a CB or an omega B, you're accreting over many, many decades of, of, of an amplifying. So even a small, inefficient dynamo could make a uh, field that's strong enough just to hold off the accretion. They're also massive stars, right? They're, they're reaching the main sequence before they stop accreting in the length of time. They accrete through this, but they're accreting a little bit below breakout by about the same factor you're just holding. So three examples. Or in the case, in the case of the Alamax speech, right, the, it's the descendants, the binary pulsars, where you see the magnetic field that's... Can I give another example? Jupiter is also another example. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, uh, yeah, I, don't, I mean, uh, it depends on, uh, you mean, the, like, when Jupiter is forming? Or, yeah, I mean, you could agree, you, you could agree. Right, right. So, uh, I, I was thinking to answer that question, uh, like, I think global simulations try to understand what's going on because uh, yeah I mean the magnet with the magnetic field you can get like different behavior especially with the global magnetic field geometry um, so it's interesting but uh, not too well studied some people have done actually the global simulation but only very recently has, has it started to yeah. one question is there any nonlinear interaction that can lead to a cascade Uh, so the waves, oh, I see. So the waves have some kind of uh, nonlinear action. You can cascade from bigger scales down to smaller scales. Interesting. I'm not I sure. Think it's like the wrong dispersion relation in the sense that it's going like a cascade between the waves. It's like because the lower frequency, they have the wrong relation. <laughs> that would be my So the, uh, the orbital time scale is 2 pi. So you can see that the density gap is really created over only several orbits with these waves. And so, um, but uh, yeah, I mean, and then the viscous time scale, which is the time scale of the silicon gap. So it's, it's hard to say, but indeed, uh, you know, the way, yeah, the way to get, uh, you know, basically almost anything you can envision, I think, have two different, regardless of the details, have two different periodicities. Whatever carries angular momentum the close to the boundary layer, whatever carries it far away, and it's very unlikely they're going to be exactly matched. So either A, you have clearing out followed by filling in, or B, you have pile up followed by clearing out followed by pile up. So either you form gap, as in this case, filled in, or you pile up, somehow get rid of the pile up, pile up. So it's, uh, I think it would be hard to imagine a situation where everything the actual instabilities are changing. You need any kind of equilibrium first, right? Well, uh, you know, the simulation has not run for long enough because you see this gap is starting to be filled in again around 800. So
So mm -hmm. the MRI, I mean, you know, if I keep extending the disc far enough out, you know, eventually I run out of material to. So that's basically what determines when you stop that. You were, you were running out of material near the outer boundary of the stimulation. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, Why did you continue with that? Well, I mean, uh, it's already pretty expensive. This is like. So it's like 150 so we have to go another cycle through, so go. <laughs> yeah, but, uh, you know, yeah, there's metrics. Uh, yeah, it's getting very expensive. It's getting very expensive. Uh, the real answer is you need a mesh refinement, because you don't need any red No, 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 mesh there. refinement doesn't help you, because uh, your time step actually decreases during, due to the mesh refinement in the inner region. No, no, in, in the outer region, you want less, you want less resolution. Oh yeah, me mesh refinement, right? Because you don't care what's going on out there. Yeah, ideally you want some kind of Fargo type thing, but or don't general. Don't I need to walk into the outer region? Oh yeah, we don't have one in our region. Oh, I see. Fargo. You mentioned that there's four thousand uh, displacements. So this is how big is the global simulation? Um, so the global simulation, uh, like all dimensions of it. Yeah. Or, or, yeah. So in radius, it's like eight, eight, eight stellar radii, I think, and the. Forty ninety six by three eighty four by sixty four, but it's only like a uh, fraction. So it's like one sixth or one seventh of the total of the total uh, of these things. So, so global warming is a lot less expensive. They're expensive, yes. <laughs> Small uh, piece of it. I think there's many more pieces, but. Uh